When it comes to boxing defense, head movement is king. Unlike other defenses, blocking and parrying, it doesn't put you down a hand and it sets you up to counter when the person tries to hit you. So this is how to move your head for when you fight. Good head movement not only makes your opponent miss, but it sets you up to counter the opening they've just created. Whether you are ducking, flipping, rolling, pulling, or standing, it's about make them miss, make them pay. Roberto Duran says, the first thing you should learn in boxing is punch and duck. So to help me demo today, starting with ducking is gonna be our competitor, Cole. Ducking is the first technique you learn to control levels in boxing. The fastest way for you to get down to the ground in lieu of having something to physically pull you down is to fall. So the first thing I tell guys to do when they're learning to duck is you learn to lift your feet up quickly and explosively. In a sport like Olympic lifting or volleyball, this is called a drop squat. The movement I'm doing is this, where I quickly pull my knee up, and when I pull both of my knees up, I fall down to the ground. If Cole's in his boxing stance and I throw a punch at him, he yanks those feet up and he drops down to the ground. If Cole has correctly assessed that this punch is coming at his chin, the lowest that he's gonna have to duck is just below chin level. It's really important in boxing that you're not making somebody miss by a mile, you're making them miss by an inch so that you're there to punish them after they open up trying to attack you. If I'm working with Cole and he's in stance, if this is his chin level as he ducks, that's as low as he needs to get. You'll also notice that Cole's got really good habits. When he ducks, he layers in his defense and he hides behind his guard because a good opponent is likely gonna be punching in combination and is gonna follow him down. Finally, when ducking, it's important that at the very deepest, most extreme position of this duck or rolling when we get there, you are in a position that you can fight. It doesn't do me any good if Cole throws a punch at me and I go down like this, because I can't structure a punch here. I'm not dangerous from this position and Cole's gonna keep pressing his advantage. When I duck, if Cole punches at me, I'm here in a position that I can fight out of, in a position that I can see out of, and in a position that I'm threatening out of. Ducking, like throwing up your high guard or like creating distance, is what's called a non-specific defense. It's not designed specifically to counter any one punch, like slipping, rolling, or parrying a shot. It can keep you safe from lots of different attacks that might be coming your way. You see a lot of non-specific defenses early in fights as guys are still patterning each other out and feeling out what this person likes to throw and how they like to behave. Non-specific defenses allow you to collect information and keep yourself safe, and later they'll usually evolve into more specific defenses so you can counter what your opponent is doing. I've always heard rolling described as ducking with the intent to counter. Rolling is a specific defense, which means you need to know what punch is coming because you're planning to counter it. Ideally, when you're rolling, you're imagining racing your opponent's hand back to their face. So when you're rolling a shot, you're making a circle with your head. I like to carve that circle out into four quadrants. The first quadrant, you're riding the punch. The second quadrant has you getting under the punch. The third quadrant has you loading to counter. And the final quadrant either has you countering or returning to your original stance. You can see here how he's racing my right hand back to my face. So if we speed it up a little bit, bang. He's getting in there before my hand is back in a position to defend myself. It works the same way if he's rolling to his open side. When I throw my three, slow to start, he rides the punch, gets under the punch, loads the counter, and then counters through that space. If we do it a little more quickly, bang. So let's talk about some of the details of rolling here. So the first thing you wanna pay attention to is that your weight is 50-50. In case you need to change your mind, throw a different punch, or move your feet, or move your head, you can't be putting all your weight onto one foot as you roll or you're less vulnerable. You wanna make sure that anytime you're moving, especially when you're moving quickly and explosively in boxing, 
You're not leading with your face, you're breaking ground with your guard. If I'm working with Cole and I pull my left hand out like this, and he knows his opponent, myself, is throwing a hook, it's really hard for him to tell if this shot's coming high or if this shot's coming low. He hopes that he makes the right assessment, but he needs to hedge his bets. And as he rolls, he needs to get that leading hand up. So whether I'm going high or whether he misread it and I'm going low, roll, he catches that punch on his guard instead of on his face. I have lots of my young athletes, usually when they first start sparring, tell me their defense is very good when their opponent is throwing a single punch, but as soon as their opponent throws in combination, their defense falls apart. And I have to tell them that their defense isn't as good as they think it is because they're not finishing their defenses. It's really important to remember with rolling, with slipping, with ducking, with any head movement, that it's always two beats. It's a beat to get you out of the way and a beat to get you back to your original stance. With rolling, this is obvious. They roll and they don't finish, they get whacked up their center line. They roll, they don't finish, they get whacked over their shoulder. The way to fix this is to not only layer in your defense, but to finish all of these defensive movements. Roll, return, roll, return to this position where your hands are in a dependable spot and you can keep yourself safe. If ducking and rolling are about changing levels, slipping is about changing lanes. It's important that the same principles we talked about when we ducked and rolled are on display here as well. You wanna make somebody barely miss and you wanna layer in your defense if you wanna have success. So when we're slipping, I'm not twisting and I'm not crunching because I need to keep my hips and my shoulders in alignment. This allows me to transfer power from my lower body to my upper body better. It allows me to be faster. It allows me to be more energy efficient and it loads me up to counter more effectively. It also leaves me less vulnerable to being attacked. If you'll reference our video on identifying out of position fighters, you'll see why this is something that is a must for you to have success in boxing. So when Cole is slipping to his open side, this is a tiny little squat. He bends evenly through his knees and his hips. And if his chest is pointed at 45 degrees forward, then his head is gonna move forward and down at 45 degrees. If I go to hit Cole, he slips out of the way, just barely. If he's doing this correctly, this punch should coast right between his ear and his shoulder. I always imagine to help me hinge like somebody's yanking down on the seat of my pants. As my hips go back, my head counterbalances forward. The next thing you'll see that Cole's doing really well here is as he slips, he takes that lead hand and he puts it on his jawline cheekbone. When he slips, he can still see me so he can decide if he wants to counter, if he wants to go on the attack and his head isn't big and fat, like if he kept his hands all the way up at his side. He's making his silhouette smaller, and he's able to see and make an assessment on if he needs to continue to defend because there's a shot coming, or if it's safe for him to come through and counter with the two. So if I throw that shot and he sees another shot coming, he can block it, catch, or if I throw that shot and there isn't another shot coming, he can come back with that too. Slip two and attack me. If slipping to my open side is a little squat, slipping to my closed side is almost like a little lunge. All of this work is done by bending at the knees and dropping my rear hip in. Again, if boxing is anti-rotational, hips and shoulders in alignment, as I drop this hip in, my shoulder and head should move to my left and out of the way as well. This way my head has cleared a lane, I've loaded this hip to counter, and because I'm not twisting my chest and my hips, my liver and my jawline are still protected.
So just like when we're ducking and rolling, we wanna layer in our defense. So when Cole slips to his left, his jawline and his body are protected. So when I throw a three, he's already got a hand on his jawline. If I ding him off the top of the head, he's probably gonna be okay. But if I hit him on the jaw, he's in trouble. Same thing if he slips again, that body is protected. So if I try to dig for that liver, it's safe. His arm isn't hanging forward like this because his hips and his shoulders are aligned. His liver remains protected when he slips. This is the same thing when he goes to his right. When he slips to his right, that hand is on his jawline. Once again, I might ding him off the top of the head, but his jaw is protected if I throw a quick one-two and follow that shot up. In addition to protecting our jawline, when we bring our hand down like this, it makes the silhouette of our head smaller and it allows us to see. If Cole slips to his open side and he keeps that hand up high, not only is his head bigger, so he has to move farther to get out of the way, but he can't see the next punch that's coming. So if he tries to pop back up and throw a right hand, there might already be a shot coming there that he couldn't see. I have a rule when I box, and you should have it too. And it's if you lose sight of your opponent when you're in an exchange, the responsible thing to do is exit because you don't know what you're gonna peekaboo back up into. It might be a big, dangerous punch. If Cole slips and he lifts that left hand up and he loses sight of me, the responsible thing to do is exit the exchange and then re-engage. So our final lesson on slipping is talking about how to sequence flips. If I'm slipping back and forth or I have to slip several straight shots or uppercuts in a row. When I'm slipping quickly back and forth, it's important that I'm going left, right, left, right, left, right. I joke with my guys frequently, and I say you can slip to the same side one and a half times because sometimes you can get away with it. But you'll see with Cole, when he slips to his open side, I'm gonna follow him down to his open side. So if he slips again to his right, he gets in a worse and worse position that's harder and harder for him to counter out of and harder for him to defend out of. It's important to remember that in boxing, depth, is a finite resource. So to slip correctly, you need to channel your inner Mike Tyson. You need to focus on turning that back hip, strong legs, strong core, and you need to pull right, left, right, left, right, left. If I throw several straight punches at Cole, let's say four, one, two, three, four. He's moving back and forth and I'm stuck chasing him left and right instead of following him down and cornering him at the end of his balance, at the edge of his comfortable stance. So let's talk about an extreme style like Mike Tyson's peekaboo style. So Mike Tyson knows as a short pressure fighter that he's going to have to slip in past several jabs, several straight punches, several uppercuts before he's in range that he can hit somebody. So he leans into the extreme aspect of this style. He makes his head small, he protects his jawline, he makes sure that he can see, and he slips while stepping quickly past the offense of his opponent so that he can get into range to be able to attack. This is the same tactic we just talked about with Cole, but instead of doing this and switching your hand every single time, you know it's gonna be there, you just commit to it being low. Modern boxing, the YouTube era of boxing, is plagued by folks that watch a lot of highlights and don't spend enough time watching entire fights. If you watch an entire Mike Tyson fight, he spends plenty of time on the outside in an outside guard. He spends plenty of time in the middle distance with a high guard. And he uses this peekaboo, this famous peekaboo style to make that transition, to close in on his taller opposition. So two additional specialized head movement techniques, if you're very tall or if you're very small. If you're very tall, like my buddy Cole over here, 
you can step back or pull back from a shot. So if I go to hit Cole, he can just take a step back and he's not there to be hit anymore. Or he can drive off the front foot and he's not there to be hit anymore. And if you're really tall, you can literally just lean your weight onto that back foot and you're not there to get hit. I encourage my more middle of the bell curve sized fighters to replace their instinct to pull straight back from a punch with an instinct to duck under the punch. Nine out of 10 times, unless you're very, very, very tall, you're gonna have a better outcome replacing this pull instinct with a sink instinct. Tall fighters can pull out of range because they are taller than their opponent. When you fight somebody your own size, this tactic will not be as effective. So our final head movement tactic is an exclusively small guy technique. This is called the stand. If Cole and I are fighting, and I'm already in this very low, exaggerated, small fighter position, when he jabs at me, I can go left, I can go right, I can duck under, and I can stand up and I can make this shot miss me, go under my chin. It's a risky thing to do, but it's one of my favorites, especially if I stand up with a hard, committed cross. So a final thought on moving your head in boxing. You wanna make sure that when you move your head, you look dangerous. You're in a threatening stance. It's not enough to just get out of the way, because if you just get out of the way, they're gonna keep pursuing you. They're gonna keep going back to that well. If I'm working with Cole and he throws a jab at me and I do this and I don't look very dangerous, I don't look like I'm ready to hit him, then he's gonna press his advantage. But if I'm working with Cole and he throws a jab at me, I do this and my eyes are up and I'm in a poised, aggressive position and I'm ready to spring into action and hurt him back, he's gonna think twice about pressing his advantage. That buys you some respect and it buys you some clock time. This concept of looking dangerous as you're being defensive is as specially important as you fatigue, as you get tired, because the threat of the attack is gonna stop this person from treating you like a heavy bag. So, to practice these techniques by yourself, you're gonna be using a slip bag or a headhunter bag. This can be as simple as having a tennis ball tied to a string taped to your ceiling. It just has to be something that swings rhythmically. This is the single best piece of equipment that I've ever used for my solo training. If I don't have a coach present, this gives me feedback if I'm doing this correctly because it'll hit me. So I can practice all of my techniques except for the stand on this piece of equipment. If it's coming straight at me like straight punches, I can slip left, slip right, or duck. And if it's going side to side like hooks, I can practice ducking, rolling left, rolling right, and the pull if I'm a tall athlete. Some final takeaway thoughts. Whether you're ducking, rolling, slipping, pulling, or standing, you need to make sure your weight's 50-50, you're making the person barely miss, you're layering in your defense so that you're dangerous for when you fight.